special lecture by a special lecturer. Yeah, I think I would have to introduce Dr. Roland Silva. But uh, see if you are considering the development of archaeological field and the conservation field, especially through heritage preservation. I think uh, contribution of Dr. Roland Silva is no must be done. Establishment of uh, the Central Cultural Fund and being the Director General of uh, the Department of Archaeology and uh, uh, not only in Sri Lanka, in the world, bringing ICOMOS into a very high standard. ICOMOS was a uh, uh, European club earlier, but um, he was appointed as the president, international president for three consecutive sessions, nine years. Uh, and the contribution that he has done to the conservation of heritage in the world is uh, can, cannot be compared with anybody's contribution. Here, <coughs> if you really look at uh, uh, the Sri Lankan context, say, Stupa is one of the major architectural elements in the country. Uh, there is no, no stupa in this country from Kantarodi in the north to Kiriviheri in the south where his contribution has not gone in conservation. Enormous contribution, uh, not only at your work, bringing up uh, many, uh, say, followers to continue uh, what he has started. and. Uh, I think, uh, say, not only work, but he has uh, written enormous amount of uh, research papers, a lot of books published, and uh, I think uh, we must request him to really sit down and write all the experience that he has gained in his life, because it will be a contribution to mankind, not only to Sri Lankan. Uh, people. Uh, with that little introduction of a great man, I request Dr. Rizila to deliver the speech. Stick to my written document, then try to speak. Uh, the cuffs because I might not allow you to go for dinner otherwise. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, um, the subject as you've seen on the screen is Mantai. Mantai, the great emporium of Cosmos Indocoplaeustus, pronounced phonetically. Sometimes the spelling is also different. You might find one spelling there and the one in your paper or any other document. Whatever it is, um, I, I presume all of you know where Manta is, or Mantota, or Mana. Mana. So, moving on, you can see that uh, we are touching on this very important port, which was the center of the globe of navigation. And uh, I will stick to the text as I mentioned before. And we say, ladies and gentlemen, we are deeply privileged to be able to address this learned audience on a subject which we are presently investigating. We are most conscious of the unknown rocks and whirlpools that we may chance to encounter as the audience to whom we are addressing this paper can be specialists in this discipline and could well contest many of the suggestions that we may present. However, the progress of science demands revision, rethought and reformulation of instincts, ideas and ideals. This is one of the earlier maps 
where they did not know orientation as much as we might often be when we've taken a little too much. <coughs> Mana Island seen against the Pearl Banks of Sri Lanka with the International Waterway passing through the larger Mana Channel and the smaller Pambam Passage which lay between the two nations of India and Sri Lanka. The Palm Passage was a recent creation, meaning in 1484, I think, 1484, I'm subject to correction, there was a tsunami, <coughs> and it was a tsunami that created the Palm Passage, which is a passage between, uh, <coughs> between the very famous temple on the Indian side, which broke itself out into an island and the passage created between the temple and the mainland. And that was Pambam Passage created as a tsunami, after the tsunami. Now that's the more realistic map that you will see. And again I have marked the two passages, Pambam Passage and the Mena Channel. And you see the realism and the dividing line what we call the international line separating India and Sri Lanka. <coughs> Apart from Cosmos Indocopleustus, spelled phonetically, of the 6th century, De Queros, the Portuguese writer, was also one of those who referred to Mantota as an emporium. There's more text you might be able to read in the web page of the National Trust, which I will not touch. I will touch only the larger print. The popularity and the usage of Mantota as a major highway, a major highway port, is clear from the many and continuous historical references to this port in the different trade records and chronicles. The Sri Lanka, a continuous navigational hub in relation to Europe and Asia. This is a map taken out of the itinerary of Shenho in the early 15th century. It shows the link that where Sri Lanka is the hub as against the travels from the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, and even the east coast of Africa. And on the other side, you have the links to Burma, and then through the, uh, through the Straits of Malacca, through Uta Island again, moving more northwards, and further eastwards, going up to Java, and then turning north, towards China and, uh, and uh, the Chinese ports there. <clears throat> Considering the position of Sri Lanka in this global and navigational context in the ancient world, Sri Lanka stood to much geographical advantage in three ways. One, it was the vital southernmost point of mainland Asia. You might even say southernmost point of Euro-Asia. B. It was almost on the equator where the navigational winds and monsoon effects changed directions. This is critical because we relied on wind power until the steam engines came into operation. And flying through me there was not even known, except for dreamers like Leonardo da Vinci. And see, it was a halfway point between the two great empires of Rome and Beijing. You can see the Roman Empire came right up to beyond Turkey. It had its extensions in the time of, of course, Alexander, before the Roman times, right up to the Kabul. 
in and around Kabul, we had a dozen Alexandrias which were constructed. And beyond the Oxus River, you had Alexandria the furthest, much of which has been carbon bombed. This is the unknown part of modern history, carbon bombed. Considering these geographical features, Sri Lanka was a necessary port of call for anchorage, waiting for the right winds for the onward journey across waters without land in sight, and for the collection of food, water and other supplies. To consider Sri Lanka as a port of return to ships calling on the island, either from the east or the west. And I'll tell you why we call it a port of return. Because wind directions change every three months. And if you don't return home within the specified time of three months to go and three months to come, you probably have a problem at home. A divorce suit, I'm sure. <clears throat> An ideal staging post for the transshipment of goods and for the barter of such products that were traded between the distant empires of Rome and Peking. It's an interesting map drawn in the dark ages of the European cultures. The importance of Sri Lanka is emphasized in this dark age map of the world. When you say dark age, Dark Age in Europe, not of the East. The East was flourishing at that time. The Dark Age map of the world, where the three known continents in early and medieval times, namely Europe, Africa and Asia are shown, and Sri Lanka, within brackets Ceylon, is highlighted, and that next to paradise. How much of a paradise is yet to be known and you have to sense your mind to imagination. Sorry, I might indicate that Sri Lanka and this is the Nile, so Africa divides onto this side and Asia on the other side and that's the Danube and that is Europe with Great Britain shown here and Italy, Greece sticking out, Spain, and Jerusalem in Asia, Nile, Africa. <clears throat> there was consistent interest in the affairs of the island by the numerous reports documented throughout the ages by officials, travelers, and traders. The map that follows from the first century AD records the land link, not the sea link, the land link between the west end, west end of Europe with Taktraban, which was Sri Lanka. Thus recording the historical relevance of continued trade and other contacts. I move on to the map, and that's the front page of the map, which is a map which was originally drawn in the first century AD revised in the 4th century and then revised again in the 12th century. A document that was in Bibliothèque Nationale in Vienna, but lost to it. Destroyed in fact because it was too delicate and too fragile for preservation. 